So what's your name? Uh, my name is Neil Hall. Um, and if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? <laughs> I am 56 years old. Um, what service were you in? I was in the Royal Navy. Um, what was your rank title? Um, I retired as a Lieutenant Commander. Um, how long did you serve for? Uh, I did 29 years in the regular Royal Navy and then 10 years in the Royal Naval Reserve, so 39 years in total. Uh, when did you join? I joined um, in May 1975 as a junior seaman. Uh, what was it like leaving home? Um, well, it was, it, I think initially it was a bit, um, you get a little bit homesick, but um, you, you soon learn to get over that and you're, you're so busy most of the time and you don't, you don't have time to worry about it and you get used to um, the, the new environment that you find yourself in. What, um, what was your training like? Um, I started um, my training at a place called HMS Rally, um, which is the new entry establishment for all naval ratings um, in Tor Point in Cornwall. And I did a six week basic training course where they teach you to march, wear your uniform and all, all the really and basic naval discipline and naval type stuff. Then I stayed at HMS Rally for another six weeks um, to complete uh, seamanship training, which uh, um, I, was, I joined as a junior seaman, so I completed my seamanship training. And at the end of the 12 weeks, I was actually held over in the training establishment because I'd been recommended uh, straight away for promotion to uh, officer. So I had to go through uh, a selection process uh, for that, which I was ultimately successful with. And um, I was commissioned as a naval officer in September 1980. I went to Britannia Royal Naval College, Dartmouth. Um, in between that, the period of joining up and going to Dart Dartmouth, I had to uh, complete my education. I'd left school with several O levels, but um, I didn't have an O level in mathematics, uh, so I had to spend some time um, doing that to get my O level maths before I could be be commissioned. Uh, what equipment did you use? Were there any kind of equipment like? Well, when you say equipment, um, we were taught obviously how to use a rifle. And yeah, like yeah, weapons. Yeah. Yes, we were, given, we were given weapon training. In those days, we had what was known as the self-loading rifle, SLR, which is a 7.62 um, NATO variant round, very powerful weapon, quite a heavy weapon. Um, we were taught how to, how to use that. And obviously, when we did um, our drill on the parade ground, that was the, uh, that was the rifle we carried. If you could add another role, um, what would it be, what would it have been? What well, if I hadn't joined the services? Um, yeah. Well, actually, I, I did do the other thing I was I was going to do in in the end because it was a toss up when I was at school whether I was going to go into the armed forces or into the police service. Uh, so when I actually left uh, the Royal Navy, I became a police officer for ten years. So I only retired uh, this year from the police service. So that would have been my that would have been my alternative anyway. But I was very fortunate in that I got to complete both careers. Um, can you tell me your daily life in the services? What was it kind of like? Um, there is no such thing as daily life in the services as such. Every day is different. You're always doing something different. Um, depending on where you are, what branch of the service you're in, um, what uh, what rank you are, it, it's it's so variable. You really cannot give a sort of normal daily, daily routine. Um, what challenges did you face and did it any, any of it kind of affect you? Um, I faced, well, we faced a lot of challenges. Um, for the first seven years I was in the Royal Navy, I, I mean, I sort of looked upon it as a great way to go around the world, to drink beer and meet interesting women. Um, but uh, in 1982, we got a big wake up call uh, with the Falklands War. So I was involved um, in the Falklands War right the way through with that, saw quite a lot of action um, and all of a sudden you realise that uh, yeah, this is what the armed forces do for real when you're being people trying to kill you, dropping bombs on you, uh, shooting at you, it, uh, it sort of changes your perspective a little bit. Uh, subsequently after the Falklands War I went on to see active service, um, two tours of duty in Northern Ireland the Gulf Tanker War uh, between Iran and Iraq in the uh, 1980s. I was involved um, when the Americans raided uh, Libya in 1986 from the only Royal Navy ship that was actually there for that. Um, I was then 
I went right the way through the first Gulf War in 1990-91. Um, I then did two, two tours in Bosnia. Um, then after Bosnia, the next thing I ended up was uh, in the relief of Sierra Leone in 2000, where I saw some action, well, yeah, some unpleasant things there. Um, and then after that, uh, I was involved in the support for the second, uh, the second Gulf War in uh, 2003, but I retired from the Royal Navy a year later in 2004, and then, as I say, I went into the reserves and became a police officer. So I have seen a considerable amount of combat and um, unpleasantness over the years. Are you still a police officer? No, I retired. I retired from the police officer, uh, from the police force this year. Yeah. Oh. Um, were there any aspects of sports in the services? Oh yes, yes. The, the services are very, very good for uh, for sport. You can do just about any sport these days um, in the armed forces. And sport used to be positively encouraged. I mean, every Wednesday, for instance, if you were based ashore, Wednesday afternoon would be a sports afternoon, and you'd go and play whatever sport that you wanted to. That's really nice. Yeah, um, and when you're on board ship. It's very difficult to play sports, obviously, because unless you're on an aircraft carrier where you've got a nice big flat deck, um, it's it's a bit difficult to do any any real sports. So what you do is a fitness regime, and um, you do circuit training, weightlifting, exercise bikes, running machines, rowing machines, that sort of stuff, just to keep yourself fit. Because obviously, as a serviceman, it is your duty to to keep yourself fit and active. Were there any other kind of entertainment the services provided to you? Well, when I, yeah, you've got to remember, when I joined up in 1970, which is long before you young ladies were even born, <laughs> um, we didn't have the facilities you have now with all the modern internet and um, mobile phones and laptop computers. They just didn't exist. In fact, I didn't actually get my first mobile phone until uh, I, I had to have one as a duty officer in 1997. Uh, uh, and that was the first time I had a mobile phone. It was like a small brick in my pocket. Um, which, <laughs> uh, so back in the 80s, or 70s and 80s, the entertainment we used to have would be uh, listening to the radio. Um, a lot of ships in those days, they didn't even have televisions on board. Um, and a couple of times a week, they would actually have film shows where they would use reel-to-reel -reel films with a cinema projector rather than um, a video or a DVD player. That you, you know, everybody's got a DVD player now. Yeah, you can watch DVDs on your phone, can't you? But uh, back then, it seems like, it seems like a different, uh, well, it was a different era. You, know, you just didn't have that facility. So we made a lot of our own entertainment as well. Um, we used to, um, it used to be quite often, we'd have sing-alongs and we put on productions on board, you know, little playlist type things. Um, called Sod's Operas, where we used to basically uh, take the mickey out of uh, everybody. No one was spared. Um, and that used to be good stuff because people had to go away and think about it. We had to improvise with how we were going to put props and all that sort of thing. Uh, newspapers, of course, were very important in those days. It's the main, main form of getting the news, but often because we were away at sea, we didn't get the newspapers until days, weeks later. So we were quite often, uh, unless we could get a radio signal for the world, BBC World Broadcast, we were quite often behind with the news. And communication with friends and family was all done by handwritten postal letters in those days. <coughs> Sorry. Um, that's alright. That's alright. That's unfortunately because of the prosthetic, it's... Um, should we my... Now first. Anyway, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you pass any other free time during training? Um, when you say free time, you talk about leave or. Uh... Um. Yeah. Any kind of leave or. Yes. Well, you, the service is very generous with leave. Um, and if you're you're shore based or your ship's alongside on the weekends, unless you're duty, you get most weekends uh, free, and it's and you get six weeks uh, a year. Um, annual leave as well, normally broken up uh, over the, the sort of Christmas, Easter and summer periods. Um, was there any possible 
uh, for you to communicate with your family and loved ones at home? Well, as I said, the only way we could communicate back when I joined up was um, by letter or uh, no, letter. Uh, or go to a pay phone, you know, and the old red box telephones that we used to have. You don't see them anymore, do you? Um, and that got better over the years, and they, they introduced systems into the ships in the 90s where we, where we had a, a, a sort of credit card where we could use that to um, use a satellite phone installation on board to phone home. But of course now, uh, everybody's got a mobile phone and you can phone from anywhere in the world just about, unless you're obviously right out in the middle of the ocean and you need a satellite phone then. But I mean, even satellite phones are far more affordable now than they used to be. So. And what is your favourite memory of being in the services? Oh, I've got so many memories. Um, goodness me. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, the majority of my career was a very happy time. Um, it's um, the people, as much as anything, the people you serve with make, uh, make for a great service uh, career. You meet so many interesting uh, characters and Obviously, I've been to I've been to lots of places. I've been most most of the way around the world. Um, visited many many countries in my career. Um, met as I say, met lots of good people in foreign countries as well, which is always a fascinating experience and um, broadens your horizons. So, I think it's just safe to say I, that the whole thing really is basically pretty happy memories. Obviously, some of the stuff uh, I was talking about earlier with the wars and uh, the conflicts, not not so much fun, but the great thing about the services um, is the service humour and the way we get through things like wars and conflicts is to make, make a joke of it and laugh and, you know, always be positive. Uh, what different countries um, did you go to? Um, I've been pretty much everywhere in the world apart from the Pacific area. I never, never actually got down to Australia, Asia or into the Pacific, but I was based in the Far East, uh, Middle East. Uh, I've, in several countries in Africa, all around Europe, North America, South America. So. What was conflict, conflict like? What do you think you'd like to say about conflict? I think probably the safest thing you can say about conflicts is that old adage that 95% of the time is sheer boredom and 5% of the time is sheer terror. Because you spend a lot of time waiting for stuff to happen. And then mm. when it's happening, it is pretty, pretty frightening. Um, but you, you know, the training we get is, uh, I think, is so good that people just actually automatically get on with their jobs and don't worry about the danger. You don't even really think about it until afterwards. It's, that's, I think, um, is when it really comes home to you after it's happened and you, the adrenaline stops pumping and you calm down and that's when yeah, you, you, you feel it then. Were you ever decorated? Um, I have a selection, I have a very wide selection of um, campaign medals, but um, I never actually received any uh, gallantry medals. Can you talk about any of the significant things that have happened during your time in, the, in serving? Um, well, I, I'd imagine probably one of the most significant things during my time in the service was the Falklands War in 1982. And of course, that was what I would call the last sort of proper war that uh, the British have been involved in. And I say that because it, ca it covered all aspects of warfare. You had, you had the fighting um, at sea, you had the fighting in the air, and you had the fighting on the land. Uh, submarines were used to sink ships. Ships were used to bombard shore establishments. Um, we had air battles with fighter aircraft and bombers. And of course, we had the soldiers and marines ashore fighting, fighting on the land. And so that was a big issue. That, um, and because we were fighting 8,000 miles away from the United Kingdom, and in those days, as I said, the only communications we had were by high frequency radio, although some ships were starting to get fitted with satellite radio communications in those days. The fact that we pulled, pulled that off and won that war is quite an incredible thing. What was it like during every day living in the services? Um, I'd say every day is different. Um, it's when you're in peacetime, you get on. You're doing basically most of the time. You are training and preparing for what you hope is never going to happen. But unfortunately, 
during the period of time that I've been in the service, it seems to happen far too regularly, we end up uh, in a war somewhere. Uh, so you're, you're training and practicing. And then in wartime, you're actually executing the mission. Um, and, so you, and of course, you never know what's going to happen or when it's going to happen in a war, what's gonna, what could happen next. So you're always waiting, as I say, for something to happen. And I'll come back to what I said earlier. It's 95% boredom then, because you're just waiting for the next, uh, the next event. And then you get on with it and deal with it. Did you have a daily routine? There's always a daily routine. Um, in the armed forces, no matter which ship or regiment or squadron that you are in, there will be a daily routine. And again, it will vary depending whether you're in peace or whether you're at war, where you are in the world, um, what your mission at that time is and what you're doing. But there is always a proper daily routine which everyone will know about and will adhere to. And everything in the armed forces is always done strictly uh, to time and on time. So a habit I have that I've never lost is that uh, I frequently look at my wristwatch because I always like to know what the time is and in the services you always require to be five minutes ahead of time so if something's going to start at uh, midday you'll be there at 11.55 and, and that's a habit I'm still in now I arrived here five minutes uh, exactly five minutes early before I was expected. <laughs> uh, can you share your most vivid memory? My most vivid memory, um, probably looking back at it, the, uh, the first time in the Falklands War when we went to action stations, none of us, none of us knew what was going to happen and I've got a wonderful photo um, at home of the uh, three other guys I shared um, a cabin with and we were all very young officers at that stage and we were all sat there in our action clothing which down in the Falklands was heavy duty overalls. Um, white anti-flash gloves, white anti-flash hoods, um, wearing life jackets, carrying a survival kit, um, and uh, we're all sat there just waiting for something to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. We know that very shortly we're going to come under attack. And the look, of the look on those guys' faces, it just says it all. And then when the action alarm sounded and we went to action stations, uh, I'll never ever forget that first time of coming coming under attack, coming under fire. Uh, do you attend any reunions? Yes, um, I'm, very, I'm very involved um, in, in fact I've been to several recently and I'm off next week down in Plymouth for some more. So yes, I'm very involved in Veterans Affairs now and uh, the reason you've got me here today is because I'm now the volunteer ambassador for the Queen Alexander Hospital Home for uh, Disabled Veterans. And as I say, I'm now officially classed as disabled myself because of the, uh, the cancer I had and uh, the disfigurement it's, it's caused me. Um, how does reunions make you feel? Does it make you happy or does it kind of make oh, you Oh, no, no, they're always, they're, they're always great fun. Uh, they're always great fun. We probably have far too much to drink and start telling, telling war stories and old, and old jokes and stuff that we've all heard before. But, you know... I think it's, it's, it's a coping mechanism in some, in some respects. People need to do that. Um, I've been very lucky, personally. Um, you know, touch wood, I haven't uh, had any, any side effects, but I do know people who have, and uh, I, I quite often find that by, you know, they, they, they attend these reunions, they, they find it helps them. Are you still in contact from anyone from back then? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, we had... Um, the ship I served on in HMS, uh, HMS Andromeda was the ship I served in the Falklands War. We had uh, the 30 year reunion two years ago. So yeah, we still, still keep in touch. So what's your favourite memory overall? Well, you asked me that just now and as I said, it's, it's very difficult to, to pin, pin down a favourite memory. Uh, I've got so many. Um, but as, as I said, I think it's really, you know, the people that I serve with will always remain you know as a, as a great feature of my time in the Royal Navy